After 70 years of exile and captivity from the marauding Babylonians, a remnant of the deported Jews returned home to Israel. For hundreds of years, they had been regularly, repeatedly warned by the Lord of their abominable sins of idolatry and immorality. Jehovah had sent his prophets to preach to his people, to plead with them, to remind them of his word, their covenant that they made with him that they would obey his law, pleading with them to repent. They yo-yoed back and forth, confession and repenting, with brief respites of conforming, at least outwardly, to the worship of the one true God, and then they would return to their old ways. It kind of sounds like our spiritual lives at times, does it not? A prophet would be raised up and sent by the Lord with the message from heaven. The nation would repent, and on and on and on the cycle would go until finally the Lord allowed the Babylonians to come and to discipline his people to by ransacking their land and taking a vast number of them, the best, their young people, uh, those that would be profitable to their, their empire, that would take them back and, and train them and use them in their own kingdom. We cannot tell the Lord how he is to fulfill his word. The psalmist proclaims God sits in heaven and he does whatsoever he pleases. Israel could not believe they were absolutely dumbfounded that God would allow the Babylonians of all creatures on earth to be their judge. These pagans, these idol worshipers, these immoral, horrible people to ransack, to invade, to destroy their homeland. How could Jehovah do such a thing? Would he allow the temple to be destroyed? No, no, no. He could not allow this glorious temple to be destroyed and the holy vessels taken into idolatry. Their religion had devolved into a superstitious notion that as long as they had his house and as long as this throne, his earthly throne, the Ark of the Covenant was in their midst, that all would be well. Religion relies on externals. And true salvation rests the soul upon the word of God in obedient, repenting trust. Now they're returning. After 70 years, the Lord allows his people. Only a remnant wanted to return. The rest had been assimilated into the Babylonian empire. But a, a remnant returns. A remnant has a vision of restoring and rebuilding there is a seemingly insurmountable work to be done, as you can imagine. The walls are down, the, the, the gates are gone, the temple is destroyed, but they had nothing. They had nothing but the Lord. And nothing is too hard with the Lord and his word and his promises and his will. The psalmist realizes the most important thing is not simply returning to the land physically. Some people think if they just make a change, go to a different place, uh, make some those kinds of changes, they realize that that was not the case. But the, the first and foremost, a true revival of the heart within was going to be necessary for them to be returned to their place as the people of God. And so he cries out there in verse 1, Lord, as Psalm 85, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people and has covered all their sins. Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God. There was still a work to be done. Far greater than the reconstruction of the temple and the rebuilding of the walls and the refastening of the, the gates was a work of the heart. The Lord had graciously brought them back. Only he could do such a thing. They had no power as they were when they were first taken as, as slaves in Egypt. They could not have set free themselves. They could not have returned. They could, did not have the influence with the, the rulers of, their, of the time. The Lord graciously brought them back. Now would he not restore them spiritually as well? As one has noted, they made what God had done for them the ground of their prayer that he would complete what he had started. They could not believe that he would only half forgive them and only half remove his anger. And so they asked for the fullness of that which of which they had had a foretaste. That is the right line to pursue child of God. And it will never be pursued in vain. The psalm before us is a plea for the Lord to 
revive his people, for spiritual revival. We see here the first step in revival is a thorough dealing with sin, something we're loath to do. This is repentance described in, in verse 4 as turning. It is an about face, which is a, the simplest way of looking at repentance, a total change of mind and attitude and thought and philosophy toward what we had originally held to or excused that violated God's word. It's a turning, and only God can do this. There's an outward semblance of repentance we'll talk about in just a moment, but there's a true heart turning that is necessary. And so often we settle for some of it. We go just so far when the Lord would have a thorough work of repentance within us. Turn us, O God, of our salvation. They're saved, but turn us and cause thine anger toward us to cease. There will be no personal nor corporate revival without a thorough dealing with the thoughts and the attitudes and practices of the heart that oppose the Lord and oppose his word and his will. David, remember when he sinned against the Lord in 1 Samuel chapter 11, and his pastor came to him and pled with him and showed him his sin after that year of absolutely wallowing in his, his sin, and he was just a, a pitiful sight. We have Psalm 51, a very vivid, one of the most personal psalms in all the Bible, the very prayer that pray, David prayed in his restoring himself, his relationship to the Lord. And there he cries. We get just a foretaste. How often have we turned to Psalm 51 and made it our prayer? Oh, have mercy upon me, O God. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions plural. Purge me, wash me, hide your face from my sins, blot out all of my iniquities. He repeats these words, created me a clean heart and renew. There it is. Revival, renew there a right spirit, a right attitude toward you and toward your word and toward life. Renew this God word, God perspective within me. And so, by the way, the reason David is called a man after God's heart is he never ceased repenting. He was a repenter from beginning to end. He dealt with his sin. He brought it before the Lord. And that's why he's called and why he's held up to us an example of a man after God's heart. First, repentance of all known violations to God's will and word, and then the plea for revival. What is it? Revival is a renewed, a, a reignited, a, an awakening of the soul by the Spirit of God, whereby the revival is brought to a nearness, a hypersensitive sensitivity to the will and the ways of the Lord, and our how far short we may fall from conforming to His will in those ways. It's a spiritual sensitivity of closeness to the Lord and desiring what He desires. There's a personal intolerance for those things we once excused and, and swept under the rug, so to speak. The flesh will always make accommodation. It will always make excuses for our spiritual status. This is just the way I am. Have we ever reasoned that way? Everybody does these kinds of things. As long as I'm not hurting anybody else, it's okay. I'm not as bad as I used to be, or I'm not as bad as my husband or my wife or my neighbor at least I still go to church. All those excuses that we, we use as a, a framework to bolster the soul and to try to, uh, to make it through. On and on it goes, and the heart gets harder and harder and farther and farther away. Like the elder brother who never left location, but his heart was a million miles away from the father in Luke 15. We can often see the need for national revival. There's not a person under the sound of my voice who would not say, me and pastor, we need a national revival. Look at our nation. Oh, the churches, look how bad the churches are today. Look what, what goes under the guise of Christianity. Oh, yes, pastor, we need in the church here. And many of you would agree, we need the revival of the Lord. We can see the need of corporate revival, church-wide revival, but rarely... Rarely do we see the need for personal, serious ransacking and repentance and renewal. 
beware, beware of being comfortable with your spiritual progress. The closer you get to the Lord, the more his word performs its particular surgery upon the heart, upon the soul, upon the inner man with that laser-like precision that the writer of Hebrews tells us only the Word of God can do. The Word of God is alive. It's it's a living thing. This is not just a book. It is a spiritual, supernatural tool of the Lord. The Word that you're hearing today, the Word that you hold in your lap is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, any surgeon's scalpel piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. There are physicians here today that will echo the fact you cannot dissect the soul. You can't even see it. You can't x-ray it. There's no test you can perform to find it. And yet the real you is the soul. And the, one, the, the, the great physician uses his word to do surgery upon the soul. It divides asunder the joints and the, and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Lord is just as willing to visit his people with genuine, heartfelt, soul-stirring revival as he is in bringing them salvation to start with. What kind of God would he be to save us and then leave us to flounder in this spiritual morass that we have to deal with with the world, the flesh, and the devil? If Satan cannot keep us from being saved, he will labor to keep us neutral and religious and disengaged, fettered in sinful attitudes and selfish ways, walking contrary to God's will for us and his best wishes to shower upon us all under the guise of religion and spirituality. It seems as if many of the Lord's people are content to hobble into heaven instead of running the race and finishing the course with great blessing and joy and reward. Turn us, he cries, Turn us, O God, of our salvation. That must be our prayer. Individually and corporately here at Glen Iris, turn us, O Lord. Turn us by your word. I must, as your pastor, I must warn all of us here of the danger of incomplete repentance. Satan loves it. And most of God's people are enamored by it or at least influenced by it and, and counterfeit. It's a counterfeit, but they will accept, we will accept for the real thing if we don't, are not aware of it and know what to look for. I, I repeat myself, beware of incomplete repentance, of being sorry emotionally, of being sorry or, or without a, a thoroughgoing, drastic dealing with personal sin as God's word prescribes it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, you'll remember, and let me give you the background for the, this text from, the, from the, uh, the apostle. A professing believer, a member, a leader in the church, was living with his stepmother as his wife. They had done nothing to correct it. They were even as you can imagine, unbelievably to us, but we can see it today, even proud of their open-mindedness. And Paul was appalled when he heard of it, and he gave them explicit instructions to perform church discipline and to turn the man out of the church, saying, if he is a believer, he will repent and return. If not, you should treat him to the level that he's acting. He's acting like a lost person. Turn him over to the world and let him have the world if that's how he wants to live. But do not allow him to have the the sham acceptance of being a believer when he's acting worse, Paul said, than the heathen. That's the background for what he's about to write in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8, Paul tells us of of, of this so-called incomplete repentance, which ought to alarm all of us. As he writes to the Corinthians to deal with this man, he writes in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. And he's using that just as a change. I'm 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 not changing my mind for why I wrote you what I wrote you and told you to do what you did. For one thing, it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, you needed to deal with it. I'm not, I do not change my mind. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now, I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, 
are just in this state of we need to do something. This is horrible. The apostle thinks bad of us. What's going to happen? But that you sorrowed to repentance. And there he gives us a hint of what true repentance is. They sorrowed to repentance. They sorrowed not just short of repentance. They sorrowed all the way to they did something about it and corrected it and allowed the Lord to do a work in their midst. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. So there's a godly sorrow, a godly repentance, and there's a fleshly, fake, incomplete, counterfeit repentance that you might receive damage by us in nothing. And then he tells us in verse 10, write down, jot down, mark this verse, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow, he defines it for us. What is true repentance? Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, the self-same thing. You sorrowed after a godly sort. And then he describes it. What carefulness it wrought in you. They began to look very carefully at their lives, at their inner lives, at their, what they were doing or not doing. What carefulness. So how do we see genuine, genuine repentance? There will be great carefulness on the matters of the soul. Analyzing it through the magnifying glass of God's word. The mirror of God's word. Holding ourselves up to the standard of God's word. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Whatever it takes to, to deal with the sin like a cancer and to cut it out and to deal with it to whatever extent it takes to get rid of it. What clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Most of our problem is that we're not mad about our sin. We may be sorry that we got caught or are sorry about what they might think of us at the church, but we're not brought to that place of what it looks like in the sight of a thrice holy God. What indignation. We ought to get mad about our sin, but not just mad, but to the point of dealing with it. What indignation, yet what fear, what godly reverence it calls. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. That makes, means restitution, making things right. That is complete godly repentance that brings about revival. Actually, this was a corporate repentance. But the same is true of individual repentance. Remember, what God does for an individual, He does with a nation or He does with a church. It's, it's no difference. It's the same, same process. The Word of God doing surgery on the heart and us answering and correcting and doing what the Word tells us to do. So let me just tell us here this morning. Revival will not come unless sin is dealt with. Our constant prayer should be, Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, the word is ransacked. It's like you ladies looking for the stone out of your ring. You look down, and it's gone. You start ransacking. Or if you can't find your, your engagement ring, or that $1,000 check that someone sent you, and you knew it was here somewhere, what do you do? You begin to ransack, to find that, import, that deed, that whatever it is you need, the title to the car that the person's out on the front porch willing to buy that you can't find the title to sell it to them. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any, any whatsoever, any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So that is what repentance is. That's what it looks like. That's the, the Bible definition of it. And that's what the psalmist is praying for. Secondly, what are the receipts of revival? The days are... I know this may be a, a kind of a dated illustration, but I, I live in a time where my parents would tell me, always keep the receipt. Now, I know that today people have phones and they, they just show people stuff like this. I, I stand in line and think, what is that? You know, they just pay for stuff like that. And I know I'm, I'm a caveman. I realize that. <laughs> but uh, I was helping my, my father-in-law the other day take back something to, I won't tell you the store, but uh, I said, do you have your receipt? And I should have known he had every receipt he ever had. You know, he pulls out this big, fat um, billfold with 100 receipts, and there he retrieved it, and we took the thing back. What are receipts? Receipts are proofs that something has been transacted. And years ago, you had to have the receipt, or they wouldn't, you know, they didn't have a computer to look it up on. It was not your word. as You had to have the piece of paper, or you were stuck. How many of you remember those days? Some of you, I can see, have lost your receipt and, and had to suffer the consequences. 
What are the receipts of revival, the proofs, the results? When sin is carefully and biblically dealt with, there will be confession, forsaking, and restitution. Think Zacchaeus. When the Lord said salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house, he was a tax collector. He'd abused people. He had, he had taken from them. And Zacchaeus said, I will restore whatever it takes, fourfold whatever it takes. And what did the Lord say? Salvation has come this day to this house. We may expect real spiritual joy. I think so many of God's people have so long since they've been happy, they've forgotten what it's like. Most of you look like you're at a funeral instead of a worship service this morning. I know what you have to look at. I realize that that's, the picture's not that pretty, but spiritual joy. Why is it that we take for granted that we ought to be filled with joy and happy in this, on our way to heaven? Happy in the Lord, enjoying these lives that he's given to us, enjoying the things of God above all other things. Look in verse 6. Will thou not revive us again? Why? One of the reasons, he says, that we might rejoice and have the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That comes from Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the, the temple. The Westminster Catechism declares that man's chief and end and goal is to glorify God, make him great on this earth while we're here and to enjoy him forever. It sounds like most people would read that it is our chief end to, to glorify God and endure him forever. Just, just to hold on and endure this pilgrimage. David's repenting prayer recorded for us back in Psalm 51. Please restore to me the joy of my salvation. There can be no real enjoyment of salvation until every and all... Sin is continually dealt with all along the way until we awake in his likeness, which, by the way, is glorification. The sanctification process is a repenting process from beginning to end. Verse 8, a revived heart will be a listening heart. A joyful heart, glad that we're the Lord's and that we're his people and we get to serve him at things that are well as they are with us right now. But secondly, a revived heart will be a listening heart. I will, verse 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. You will be revived when you have the attitude, when you can't wait to be under the word of God the next time or until you open it. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Whatever you want, tell me what I need to know. Feed me today. Give me my portion. Lord, I love your word above all even necessary meat and food. We picture Mary. Remember in that household, Mary chose what our Lord told us, the good part. She was sitting at his feet listening to the Lord. No revival without, there's no revival without carefully attending to the ministry of God's word in your life. I will tell you the degree that you're spiritual is to the degree that God's word has a place, the first place in your heart and life. Another result for revi of revival is in verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. What, this is more than just a poetic, beautiful description here, although it is that. The phrase met together is one word in the Hebrew Bible. It occurs 15 times in the Bible, and in every instant and other, in every other place, it has a hostile meaning. For mercy and truth are at odds. Do you realize that? Mercy and truth, truth says, the soul that sinneth it shall die period. Mercy intervenes and interposes the Savior's blood. Salvation. But they, they should be at odds. They're, God's attributes are held in perfect balance. They don't outdo the other. They, they must be taken all as they are. Mercy and truth are at odds, but when God's mercy would say, pardon the sinner, God's truth says, no, 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 punish the sinner. God's mercy says God is love, but God's truth says God is light. So the two meet together, and the question is how? How can you reconcile these two? Everywhere else the word is used, it has the meaning of hostile intent. God could not administer mercy, folks, at the expense of truth. His word must be fulfilled to the nth degree. Not one word shall pass to that, to that every jot and tittle is fulfilled. Well, what, what are we going to do? He cannot uphold the truth at the expense of mercy, but at Calvary. At Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. 
There my burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary. That's where mercy and truth were kissed and joined. Their righteousness and peace have kissed each other. God can up now uphold both his mercy and his truth, both his righteousness and his peace through the coming of his son. He has provided a way to give us both his peace and his righteousness. Only God could devise such a plan of salvation. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Our basis for pleading for both redemption and revival. Why should we even expect it? Why do we deserve either? We don't deserve salvation. We seem at times almost unrevivable. I don't know if that's a word or not, but we, we appear that. Look into your own heart. How cold, how callous. Our basis for pleading for revival is not because we deserve it, but because of the work of the Savior at Calvary. It's as if God expects his people not only to be saved, but to be revived. Zealous, zealous of good works. When revival comes individually, corporately, or nationally, it's all the same. It, there's change. Change will take place. And usually that's what people point to. The, the, the fruit, the results of revival as revival. That's just a byproduct of all of this inner work that we've been talking about. There will be open changes. There have been times, we have been so long since we've seen it, most of us wouldn't even know what a revival looked like. We, we, we call great evangelistic uh, meetings or a large number of people being saved at a particular service revival. But when you study church history, you find there have been seasons where the Lord visited areas, nations, churches, people with heaven-sent revival as one writes, Reformation only changes the outward. Revival changes the inward. When revival comes to a nation as it did to England in the days of the Wesleys and to Wales in the days of Evan Roberts, it changes national morality. There's a new surge in church attendance. Drunkenness, immorality, crime, and dishonesty are curbed. Integrity is restored to the national character. Employers are more considerate. Employees become more industrious and dependable. There had been several notable revivals in the history of Judah's monarchy. The greatest revival was under David. The next greatest was under Hezekiah. Jehoshaphat and Josiah each sought to bring the nation back to God. The psalmist thinks wistfully of those great days. Possibly the revival under Nehemiah had not yet come, but he prays for God's fullness to come in for national repentance and national revival. This was the request. Verse 8, you say, well, Brother Lamb, what, what about us? What about me? What about today? I will hear what God the Lord will speak. That's where we start. An ear for the word of God. I will hear it. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation, verse 9, is nigh to them that Fear him, that worship, that adore, who in reverence him, that glory may dwell in our land. And then we see in verse 13, righteousness shall go before him, and he shall set us in the way of his steps. The bent, our, we'll be bent toward the Lord and his way, the way of his steps. Oh, may this be our prayer. Now, we can belabor and bemoan the point of our nation being in such dark times and the church at large being just a sham of what the New Testament tells us it should be. But I would urge us corporately here to look here, Glen Iris, and then much beyond that for us to look individually in our hearts before the Lord with an open copy of God's word saying, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. 